Leader of the House of Lords, Lord Tebbum, a Conservative Party Chairman, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf Hansen, Islamic scholar who advised President Bush following 9-11, Simon Thomas, Plaid Cymru MP, and the comedian and writer Rona Cameron. Well, welcome to, welcome to Question Time from Alexandra Palace in London, the original home of BBC television. And a panel here who, as ever, don't know what the audience are going to ask them. Uh, good evening. If you want to comment on what this panel says or what the audience says, you can, as ever, text us. 83981 is the number to text us on. And if you go to 155 CFAX, you'll be able to see what other people are saying. And if you're watching digitally, push the red button, you can do much the same. Let's have our first question, which comes from Claire Cober, please. Was a Birmingham school right to suspend a member of teaching staff when it emerged that he was a member of the British National Party who would be standing in the European elections? Valerie Amos. Well, I have to say that um, this is one area that uh, I do agree with uh, uh, the Birmingham School on. I think that the kind of views which are promoted by the British National Party where they are clearly saying that there are members of our communities that are not welcome uh, in this country. Uh, these are not the kind of views that should be promoted. Now, I'm someone that, on the whole, wants to see uh, free speech. I want to see people who are able to interact and talk about issues in our society. But at the same time, I feel very concerned, particularly now, when we are seeing increasingly uh, attacks against uh, members of Islamic communities in our country. Uh, we're seeing increasing anti-Semitism. Uh, we're hearing talk that this is all political correctness when we try to deal with these issues. I think we have to take a very, very firm stand. Would you kick out all teachers who belong to the BNP as well as people who are standing, even though it's a legal political party in this country? No, I wouldn't. Uh, it's not a matter of um, kicking out all teachers. I think that what is important is that uh, there are clear rules about uh, making sure that uh, individuals are able to say uh, whether or not they're going to stand uh, for a political party. But it's the standing these, for the political party these, that's wrong, not holding the views. These are, these are rules that apply across our political system. In my view, it's holding the views uh, I don't like people who hold those views. But I mean, now, you don't like people who hold conservative no, views, but you wouldn't no, ban them from standing for parliament. Can I, can I finish my point? <laughs> Not I, yet. It, it's a personal thing in the sense that I don't like people who hold those views. But I think that if people are going to stand uh, for political parties, then it's important that that is recognised and that they tell the authorities about that. Well, that's what they did. But Lord Tebbit, what do you think? Well. I detest the BNP. I detest all socialist parties, but I detest the BNP more than any other socialist party, and it is a socialist party, by the way. Um, but I think we would be very foolish if we start picking and choosing about which legal parties a man may belong to, stand for parliament or the European parliament, and still keep his job. I think that becomes offensive. And secondly, I think that it acts as a recruiting sergeant for the BNP. They've now got a cause. They've got a victim. They've got people who say that's not fair and who will gather round. I think far better to have let the man stand and made sure that he was thoroughly, completely, and utterly humiliated in the vote. That wouldn't help but the children I, in the school, though. No, it? but can I... Sorry, 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 no, I that wouldn't help the children in the school. I mean, I would not want my children to be taught by such a teacher. I think children should be valued in schools, treated equally, <laughs> and feel safe in school. And I don't think... So, the issue for you is membership of the BNP. You kick out any BNP member. I would be prepared to do that. I think we should have... There's a school contract now. Parents must sign up for their children to go to school. Children themselves sign contracts with teachers about no bullying, no racism in the playground mm. and so forth. This is public money educating for the future. We should not be using public money to 
peddle hate crimes and hate thought in our schools. The, it's as simple as that. Okay. The man should not be employed right. as a teacher. The, the, the he has every right to stand as, an, as, a, as a member of the European Parliament. Of course second. he does. The the second. 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 You're talking a lot, but just answer the, this question. He's a maths teacher. Yes. Why do you say he's peddling hatred in the school? How do you know? Because he does not believe that children should you be treated said equally. How do you know he's peddling I hatred? I don't know that the BNP peddles hate. The BNP the relies on well, you know, The BNP is not a party that sake. should be supported in our schools. Hamzy it's as simple as that. It's black and white in that Well, I, I was going to say, it's interesting you brought, brought up math, because I was going to say I'd probably let him teach math. And probably algebra would be a good subject because it's about balancing equations and making all sides equal. But I wouldn't want him to be teaching history. Mm -hmm. uh, and certainly not the period known as World War II. Mm -hmm. And I certainly want him, wouldn't want him to be teaching literature. Would you let and a those communist things teach humanize. history? A communist to teach history? Should a communist I, teach history? I don't think there's history in communism. Is but, there? but the Communist Party is the most racist party in the world. The communists in Russia were responsible for more deaths than any other group in the world. But you might not have uh, heard the Cold War's over. And, well, and, and now Russia's good friends with us. Okay, hold on, hold on, hold on. I think one of the major problems is that he's got those views in the first place, but isn't the point that um, it would actually impede him, um, his actual teaching, because he holds the views that some children should be taught more, have the right to be in his class, so whether how he would interact with Absolutely. the children himself, so obviously it's actually going to impede him as a teacher. So again, it's membership, not standing no, as a candidate no, in the European Parliament action. that if, worries if, you. If he acts badly in the classroom, sack so him. keep letting Norman mm. come back. He won't no, let, okay, hold I, on. Well, you know, Norman, your point about, you know, would you let a communist teach? I mean, I wouldn't be happy with a, 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 a person who supported a conservative government who introduced uh, Clause 28 to teach uh, perhaps homophobia in, in schools. Well, that's um, not true. Well, no, I'm just, we're just, you know. But I actually think it's, it's a very tricky matter because on... You know, it's, it is meant to be a democracy, and this guy does belong to a, a party, you know, a, a proper party. But as Simon said, we could all do without the British National Party. And I think there should be more humility and, and compassion in schools, because uh, the way everything's going, you know, um, we need to rid society of prejudice. And I, and I do not think a member of this party should be allowed anywhere near school, frankly. Okay. You, sir. I feel that the, uh, the emphasis should be on being a good teacher, regardless of their um, political allegiances, and they shouldn't actually reveal those uh, to their pupils. I mean, okay, when I went to school, I often used to think, well, was he a, a, a teacher point. that supported the Labour Party or read The Guardian and things yes. like that? But a good teacher will be down the middle and teach the subject. So no, no teacher can stand for Parliament or for election, because they'd have to reveal their party then. <clears throat> Oh, they can certainly reveal it then, yes, but in the classroom they have to do the uh, teach just exactly okay. as that was. Man in the second row from the back. Um, it, might, it might be argued that he's not said anything yet, but during the next five weeks he will be saying a lot and he'll be peddling a lot of racist views. If I was a teacher in that situation and I was uh, being placed um, in front of a classroom with black children in it, I would not find that that would be a situation where I could hold a professional uh, conduct. Um, in election campaigns, people do start peddling unacceptable views. Only this week we saw the UK Independence Party candidate for the Mayor of London say he wouldn't go and canvass in areas where there were too many gays. This kind of nonsense must be stamped out. OK. And you, sir. Manny. That's it. Is, it, is yeah. it that the fascists or the BNP are not Democrats is the real reason why this guy should not be teaching young people. They're not Democrats. They use democracy in order to hide behind and to carry out attacks on black minority ethnic people. That's what they do. They use democracy, they use mm. parliament. To okay. me, they shouldn't even be standing mm. for parliament. Yeah. Valerie Amos, you wanted to come back on something Norman Tebbit said. Well, really, it's on the point that if you are standing as a candidate, you are revealing your political views. Mm. And the political views being held by the BNP and the ways in which they express those views go against some of the laws we have with respect to race discrimination in, in this them. country. I agree. Prosecute then them. absolutely prosecute them. But I also think that there is an issue about the extent to which we allow these views 
to be uh, reflected by teachers in our schools. And once somebody has said that they are standing as a candidate for a party who believes these uh, things, then that becomes a real problem, I think, in our classrooms. Okay. okay. So, you know, and I'm, the man in the blue shirt there, you. Yes, I'm um, the yeah, I'd like to point out that the actual reason he was chucked out from his job as being a teacher was not because he was standing for the British National Party, but because on, on his website he published anti-Semitic and Holocaust-denying <laughs> material, even beyond what the um, British National Party would normally stand for. And so whether yeah. you believe if, um, that it's okay for a British National Party candidate to be a teacher or not, I don't think that anybody could actually agree that it's okay for somebody uh, who, who was as openly racist as he was on his website to be mm. a teacher in any He's school. Okay. Well, that's, that's fine. Yeah. Get the line in the second row, you two. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I'd like to echo the, this gentleman here's points. Um, I think it is important not to go too far. I mean, you could ban homosexual teachers, teachers that, that objectively take an extreme view in politics. Um, but on the other hand, these days it's more and more important to vet those that are in contact with mm. children. Um, and I wouldn't want anything to undermine that. But, uh, what, what about what Lord Tebb said about communist teachers being just as dangerous? Well, Would you ban them? No, I mean, the same point. <coughs> I mean, you have to rely right. on the integrity of teachers to, to, to sort of swallow their, their, their views, their prejudices, and be objective in the classroom. Okay. The, the gentleman at the very back there, Spectacles, and I come to you in front. I, I agree with Sir Norman in, in a lot of ways. It's a difficult su subject. You're opening up a can of worms now for the BNP. Um, at the end of the day, he's a teacher on one hand. He hasn't done anything wrong in his curriculum. There is a curriculum that's set by the education board that everyone has to follow. Fine, yes, everyone knows he's a, he's a racist. BNP is a legal party. And now you've just given him a, a forum for him to get louder and louder and louder. I think they should just kept an eye on him. And if it had got worse, then pull in then. But really you're then opening up a real big can of worms. It's a bit difficult with the stuff on the internet yeah. though. Yeah, exactly. Just, like, keep an eye on it. The, the for someone the, who has put anti-Semitic no... literature on their website yeah. and I has publicly... I, I totally agree with you. I, I don't doubt that. But I think the point that um, Sir Norman was making was the fact that it is a, it's a legal party. I totally disagree with it, obviously. But and, we're and it's, a legal, it's a legal, it's a legal party, party, yes, but we have to ask ourselves, do we want teachers in our schools? This yeah. is the point for me. Do we want teachers in our schools that believe that the children they are teaching are not equal? And they're paid and I, with public I'm funding. And paid from public but funds. But you're I, just assuming, don't, I just don't accept that. But, but, but you're but, assuming that's what he's taught. David, you're, do you're assuming, assuming that's, that's what he's taught. It would be hard yeah, for him to be I don't think there's, a lot, it, there's a lot of things that people believe. <laughs> When they teach it, a fireman could believe in the British National Party. It doesn't mean he's going to stop putting out fires. But surely... But he's not teaching our children, and he's not treating people unequally. Okay. That's Valerie, right. Valerie. But surely the issue is about whether or not, in the things that this guy is saying on his website, mm -hmm. he is breaking our laws in terms of uh, the protection that we give to minorities in this country through and, our race legislation. But hang on, if he's breaking the law, as Norman Tebbit yeah. said, he can be prosecuted. Yeah, and I, I, nobody's, absolute, nobody's I, prosecuted. I absolutely think he should be prosecuted. You think he should if be prosecuted? He, if he's breaking the law, I'm, he should I'm be with, prosecuted. I'm with Valerie there, but the question you have to ask yourselves is, do you think it's right that someone should be able to object to an atheist teaching their children who are Christians? Do you think it would be wrong to have a Muslim teacher in a school where most of the pupils well, that's it, are, are it? children. I think it would it's a be slippery right slope. It's a very like slippery <laughs> slope. And this and, is a and, and above school. all, what we've done tonight is to give you. huge publicity to this man who is not terribly important and who, as I say, should be humiliated at the polls. Okay, the, the man in the, the, there, and then we'll move on. I have a comment to make about, uh, I think he shouldn't be suspended. And uh, speaking from personal experience, I'm a maths teacher, I'm Indian, I'm Muslim, and I was called Paki last week by one of the students. But still, I think it is, it is kind of we are intolerant in a way of that point of view as well. Did we you have ask to him? accommodate, we have to accommodate all views. Did you ask him if he could do a quadratic equation or not? <laughs> <laughs> that would have asserted your superiority. <laughs> okay, let's, let's move on to another question. Olivia Shaw, please. Does the panel think that ex-diplomats should retire grace gracefully rather than try to influence current political thought? These are the 52 diplomats, many of them former ambassadors from the Middle East, who said that uh, British and American policy in the Middle East was doomed on both Iraq and Israel. Um, Simon Thomas, do you think ex-diplomats should go and cultivate their roses 
and well, play no further part in politics. That's what's amazing about this. They usually do. That's precisely what they do. They go to their gardens and they grow the arboretums or whatever. But these are 52 diplomats of immense experience. Some of them, like Sir Crispin Tickell, or, or, or first-rate diplomats within the diplomatic service, now questioning openly mm. what the government has been doing in Iraq and within the Middle East, and particularly the so-called peace process between the Israelis and the Palestinians now. I'm really grateful they did that. I think they've done a service paid back many years of service themselves in revealing the depth of feeling within the Foreign Office and the Diplomatic Service. And I hope it's a wake-up call to Tony Blair and to Jack Store and to uh, uh, Valerie and everyone else on this panel that we need to crack on with a peace process uh, within Israel and Palestine and our work in Iraq. And I think they have done the right thing by coming out and being, being undiplomatic uh, for once. So let's praise our diplomats for being undiplomatic. Yes, yeah, yeah. Valerie Amos. Well, I agree with Simon in that we do have to sort out the peace process. There's no uh, doubt about that. And the, the kind of things that we have seen in uh, the Middle East are absolutely intolerable on both sides, I have to say. Um, on the, the specifics of the question, I mean, should diplomats retire gracefully? My own view is that if people have a view to express, it's important that they express it. And I think that uh, having 52 former diplomats actually write an open letter to the Prime Minister just demonstrates the strength of feeling that they have, but also raises the point that there are lots of other uh, ex-diplomats, indeed current diplomats in the Foreign uh, and Commonwealth Office, who agree with our current policy. The, are they going to the, well, well, I well, don't know no. if they do agree. I think a lot of them don't want to lose their jobs. I mean, that's part of the problem. Yeah. I mean, I would say that... It, it's unprecedented, as far as I know, in, in British history. I mean, something like this, where 52 diplomats... I mean, it, uh, to me, it just emphasizes how grave the situation is. And yes. I think that, that they're, they're really frightened. I mean, and, and I think they're, they're, they're courageous in doing so. And I also think that they should be listened to, because this is several hundred years of collective experience. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, this is not something simply to, to ignore. I, I agree with you it's not something to ignore, because I think it's really important that the kind of debate that we're having with the Middle East is about the Middle East is one that we should have. But I, yeah, but, I, I mean, I I'll give you an example. I was with, and I won't mention what country, but I was with an American ambassador who, in private, said that he was just disgusted with uh, the policies from Washington, and he was in one of the Gulf states. And if that's his personal feeling, he's not expressing it for whatever reasons. So I think that you will find amongst many of these diplomats in the Corps, I think they're, they're just overwhelmed because they hear the other side, don't forget. I mean, they get earfuls that people here don't hear. And, and I think, I mean, it's just, we're looking at, at such a, 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 an incredibly uh, perilous situation right now. Valerie Amos, yeah, are, you, are you discomforted by having 52 experienced diplomats who've served in all these places criticizing government policy in quite such ferocious terms? No, I'm not, I have to say, because as I say, it's an, ex ex it's an extraordinarily difficult situation, and it's a situation that's gone on over many, many uh, years. The fact is that U.S. government policy, uh, U.K. government policy has not changed over many years. U.S. U.S. <laughs> U.S. government uh, policy on uh, the Middle East has changed in the sense that we now have a president who agrees finally that a two-state solution in the Middle East is what we okay. should be looking for, and that's been confirmed again. Uh, recently, so I'm not discomforted by it. I think it's really important that people have an opportunity to put their view. But can I just pick up one no, point? No, no, just one get, no, very no, quick no, no. You've spoken okay. quite a lot. Uh, I'm going to bring in some members of the audience. And I'll come yeah, back to you. I mean, yeah. I, I basically, I just think this whole um, letter from the diplomats just goes to show, to illustrate again, how arrogant our government is. You know, they don't seem to listen to the people. No. Or you know, to, to people in the media, people who speak out, and now they're not even listening to the people who actually know a hell of a lot more about what's going on in places like Iraq and Israel. They just ignore them again. Okay, Rona Cameron. Yep, I agree. <laughs> I agree entirely. I think it, it's, it's a wake-up call to Tony Blair. I think he's completely lost his grip. And um, I think that I welcome this behaviour. It's not extreme enough. It's the start. It's the tip of the iceberg. There should be more. And there is going to be more. 
Uh, it must be very difficult to be a member of the, the Labour Party. You see, I'm not a politician, obviously, and uh, I'm, nor am I a political expert, and I wasn't a student, so I don't come from that kind of, you know, student lefty background kind of thing in comedy or anything. But, you know, it's very, very confusing to be a person who voted in Labour who thought that it was going to be a wonderful day, you know, they're playing the Things Can Only Get Better, that was the, the song used at the time. And I was, remember I was in New Zealand at the time and I was, wore my rose, you know, and it was, a, oh, it's all over, all the misery. And um, it's so, it's so horrible, you know, it is so horrible and I will not be voting Labour in the next election because I want Tony Blair out. Because okay. this war, hang on, just one, David, just one second. I think that basically, just in a nutshell, I think that the move from the diplomats reflects extreme times, and, and I welcome this move, and, and there should be more. Okay. The, the man, uh, yep. single you out as bald-headed, but the man with the bald head. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, they all say that. Um, uh, well, I just think it's time to stop criticising the war in Iraq. I mean, it's done and dusted. We are in Iraq now, and we're in it for the long term, and to actually start trying to find a way to stabilise it, for politically and socially, just for the people dusted. of Iraq. Done and dusted. Yeah. Really? No. Done and yeah. dusted? Well, you think in, it's done and dusted? Well, we you can't think we finished in Iraq? Well, we just can't pull out of Iraq. I don't I mean, think just we're going to use the word stabilise again. <laughs> I mean, it's important to note that, th that this letter actually said one, th one thing of great importance, I think. that diplomats have never said before. They directly criticised the Prime Minister for, for supporting George Bush's current uh, uh, procedures in Iraq. They directly supported uh, the Prime uh, criticised the, the Prime Minister for not stepping aside for the military tactics now being used in places like Fallujah. All right. We are creating more problems, not less. Lord These diplomats should be marching with the two million that marched before. All right, now hold on, hang on, hang on. Lord Tebbit. All right, I'm Lord Tebbit. And, and the, the Baroness people. Amos. Can just, I, just, I, will bring I just want to pick I want up to bring, on this one point. He hasn't point, spoken please. yet. He hasn't but spoken. But it's a direct response No, I'll bring you in. Now you must do what I ask you to do. Right. Lord Tebbit. <laughs> if you to insist, so, David. I insist. I, uh, let's go back to the question whether the diplomats, uh, former diplomats, were justified. Yes, if they feel so, sure. Um, as Valerie says, they have the right of free speech, um, just perhaps even as members of the BMP do, actually. Um, so they have the right as well. Um, should they have done it? If they felt like it, yeah, sure. Um, are their views correct? Well, that's, that's perhaps more debatable. Mm. I suspect you could find a lot of ex-diplomats from the Foreign Office who would take a different view. The Foreign Office has always been very much divided between those who were pro-Arabist um, and those who were pro-Jewish, um, pro-Israeli. Um, and there's always been a conflict there between those two groups. And it's a conflict which has often got Britain into problems in the Middle East because we've tried to be on both sides at once and we've tried to ride two horses going in different directions and that's pretty tricky. Um, I. Uh, I have my reservations about the way in which the Iraqi war has been conducted, or, or more particularly, the way in which the post-war um, aspect has been conducted. The military operation to take Iraq was very well done, but I don't think that the consequences had been properly thought through. But I think also those diplomats were saying um, uh, very much that um, they were unhappy about some of the developments in the Palestine-Israel uh, context. Um, now, uh, one-sided and illegal, they said, British and American policy Yeah, I, I don't think either of those things is actually true, and I agree with Valerie that we've now brought an American president to support the two nations, um, two states' solution. That is, that we now recognize the rights of Palestine and the Palestinians, as well as the rights of the Israelis. Well, I think that's a step forward. He okay. also called Ariel Sharon a man of peace. Well, I wouldn't have gone that far. <laughs> <laughs> all right, we've got a lot of people wanting to speak, and Valerie Amos, I will not forget to bring you back in. <laughs> That's having very not kind allowed of you come. David. That's all right. The woman at the very back there in black, please. Well, I, would, I would like to point out that although we have President Bush supporting the two nation policy, both Britain and the US are currently selling what arms and weapons to the Israelis. Should they really be in charge of a peace process when they have, they, cu they cu currently benefit from the war. Okay. <laughs> the man up there on the, on the, on the, on the, in the very back row. Yeah, the man in the back row there. Yes. 
I just want to take up a point um, made by Baroness Amos about having a debate on the issue of the Middle East. I think that's great, but what's a shame is that Tony Blair just isn't listening and nothing's changed there. I want to know also from the panel, do they think that as a result of UK-US-led policy in the Middle East, there's going to be greater um, risk of terror attacks around the world? And in particular, is it more likely that there'll be a terror attack in the UK? Okay, well, let's, let, let's just deal with the Blair point, uh, Valerie Amos. <laughs> I don't agree with that point that uh, we're not listening. We worked really hard with our partners to get to the roadmap and to get the acceptance around the world of the two-state solution. Two-state solution, and you know a recognition finally from the United States, from our European Union partners, ourselves, and everyone else that we needed to see Israel and Palestine side by side, both stable countries. Now, how we get to that is what is at dispute. And we all knew it wasn't going to be an easy process because we still, on the one hand, have uh, terrorism from the Palestinian side. Uh, we're seeing activities from the Israeli side that we have co condemned in the strongest uh, possible terms. For example, when uh, they recently killed uh, Sheikh Yassim. I mean, that was totally unacceptable. President but Bush what, didn't condemn what it. We, TC we, after him. we, the British government, condemned it in the strongest possible yeah. terms, but publicly. And it's really important that we do that, that right. where we see activities that we cannot condone, that we make that clear. I think we have listened, and that's why we've got as far as we've got. But let's all remember that these processes take a huge amount of effort and time. Okay, the woman in the second row there. Um, I'd just like to say that I think the letter is obscenely unbalanced and obscenely one-sided. There's no mention of Palestinian suicide bombers, no acknowledgement that Palestinian terrorists are a fundamental obstacle to peace in the Middle East. And just, uh, sorry to Baroness Amos, I don't see why we should condemn the killing of people who are sanctioning the murder of innocent people across Israel. My family who live in Israel, who live in terror every day, I think we should hunt down all the leaders of Hamas until we can guarantee that there might be security in Israel. Well, I'd like to say that unfortunately, when I, the day I arrived in the UK from the United States, one of the headlines was, Hamza supports suicide bombing in Great Britain. And I'd like to take the opportunity to point out that that is actually Abu Hamza. And I know some, there was a picture of him, and unfortunately some people think all Muslims look alike. So I just want to point out, he has gray hair, and, and I don't. So I'm not that Abu Hamza. But I, I think, I, I find it very interesting that Baroness Amos said, terrorism on the side of the Palestinians and activities on the side of Israel. And I think that's one of the major problems. Until state terrorism is recognized and condemned, you know, and, and two wrongs don't make a right. I, I, I don't believe that, but I, I think it's very important that we identify state terrorism. When, when Palestinians' houses are being bulldozered, when, when, when people like Tom Herdell a very brave British man at the age of 22 is, is protecting Palestinian children and ends up getting shot in the head by an Israeli sniper. When Rachel Corey is bulldozed by an Israeli uh, man who's, who, who's about to bulldoze a Palestinian doctor's house. I mean, I think people don't realize we're, we're dealing with 50 years of humiliation. Yeah. You want to come back on this? Um, well, first of all, talking about bulldozing homes and little children. They don't bulldoze normal homes of innocent people. It's the homes of suicide bombers. No, no, no. People who have tunnels that's called, under that's their called, house That's called collective guilt, them. and that is unacceptable in our system of law. You do not, you do not bulldoze... If, if somebody murders somebody here in Bradford, does the, does the uh, British authorities, do they arrest the whole family? Is that the democratic... It's as a democratic... <laughs> The, the Sorry, the can I say Israel is a democratic state? At least they're letting in those two people like one, to protect like people. Do you yeah. think the other Middle Eastern uh, Muslim countries would be allow, allowing other people into? Yeah, protect that's a straw man them. argument, a the, fallacy. The, re the reiteration of the wrongs, the terrible wrongs which have been committed on both sides. Um, and which are continuing to be committed, does not necessarily advance us towards an ending of those activities. I think we have to accept that it is almost impossible for a democratically elected leader of Israel 
to go as far as he needs to do in order to make peace with Palestine. And Sharon is actually taking risks in that sense in what he is doing. I think it is impossible to see a government in Palestine able to do what is required to reach a peace with Israel. I think what is necessary now is for a little bit less of the reiteration of the wrongs and for the powerful states who can bring this um, war to an end to get in there and do it. And the, America is one because America at the end of the day can force the hand of Israel. The Saudis and the Syrians can force the hand of the Palestinians. And I think the sooner the Syrians and the Saudis and the Americans get together to try and dictate peace terms on their client states, the sooner we will get a peace. I do not see any other way of doing it. Okay. There are, there are ten of you with your hands up, but we're halfway through the program, and I'm afraid I'm going to have to move on to another question. Before I do that, uh, question time moves to Birmingham next week. And on the 13th of May, we're in St. Andrews in Fife. Uh, if you'd like to be in either of those audience, call us on 09011 or go to the BBC's website, the BBC slash Question Time, and you can also there debate some of the issues that we're discussing tonight. But our next question, if I could have it, comes from Alex Casale. If an Eastern European immigrant gets on his bike and comes here to look for work, should he be given a job? <laughs> it's a reference to something you said, isn't it? Well, all right. I, I, I don't think you should start, because you've just finished. <laughs> I can go on and on. No, I know you can. That's what worries me. I'd like to start by just... Run the camera and you do I'd, it. I'd like to start by just reminding Norman that was really bad call <laughs> to say <laughs> that. All these years ago that everybody goes on about... But I never said it. You, you did, know. so... R run the camera. Um, if an Eastern European person comes here, should they be given work? That, that's the question, yeah? got, just to recap. Yeah, we've got a yes. huge expansion coming on Saturday. Yes. And there's going to be 25 countries in the EU and Yes, I think if you come to this country, joining. you should be allowed to work and given work, and that's all part of fulfilling, you know, normal sort of citizen roles. And yes, that's all very good and healthy. I don't understand what the, uh, the problem is there at all. Is there a problem of any kind but the... Uh, enlargement of the EU for you? More EU, I love it, the whole thing. Uh, it's great and it's also good because um, it's also really good because it's, it's much more uh, against America, you know, which uh, against the Bush administration but certainly. But do you know what I mean? The, the strengthening ties with Europe is not really what they want. Now, I, I will speak quite basically because as I say I'm not like a political expert but I do feel passionately that things to do with Europe are good and um, I welcome all these new moves, it, it, you know, it's, I think things have moved on. Um, I don't care about the old British imperialist attitude. Um, I'm very happy to be a part of it and I think it's, it's great if people can come here and work and we can go there and work and freeze things up and it's, it's all a positive move forward. Were you surprised? <laughs> It's a bit simple, I know, well, but you, it's genuinely how I feel. Were you surprised that the Prime Minister appeared four days before to say that uh, Britain had reached crunch point and he was going to have a top-to-bottom analysis of immigration? I won't be surprised at anything Tony Blair does next because he is clutching at straws, frankly. Um, Jack straws. Uh, yes, indeed. <laughs> and he'd like to clutch at his after <laughs> yes. what he did to him on the referendum. Right. Very good. <laughs> Norman Taylor. No, not surprised at all. Um, I, I welcome the accession of the new 10 countries um, to the community. Um, I don't see that we're going to have much of a problem with immigration from those countries. Uh, I've got in my flying log books from my Air Force career a lot of Czech and Polish names of Czechs and Poles who came here during the Second World War and thank God they did, because without the Poles in particular, we would probably have lost the Battle of Britain. Uh, they were a vital part of it, that Polish contingent. So I welcome them. They will integrate into this country. They will fit in very well indeed. 
Will we get any bad eggs amongst them? Of course we will. Will we get any scroungers? Of course we will. Uh, we've got plenty of scroungers of our own. Will we get mostly good people? Yes, we will get mostly good people. And they will be mostly good British citizens who in two or three generations, apart from having names which are still slightly unpronounceable, will be as British as I am. Okay. The, the gentleman in the second row there. Yeah, I, I agree with um, uh, Lord Tebbett totally. I think immigration and employment for um, Eastern Europeans is a, is a great thing. Um, but I'd just like to ask uh, Baroness Amos, uh, what, um, why is the government sending out unclear messages? Why can't we just get a clear message as to whether they will or won't um, be gaining employment? Baroness Amos? Um, I think... Uh I think the messages have been confused and I think that they've been confused for two different reasons. I think they've been confused because asylum, what we're doing on asylum and what we're doing on immigration and particularly managed migration has become very confused indeed. It has. Yes, <laughs> yes it has and um, I also don't believe that I would ever agree with most of what Norman Tebbit said on immigration but I just did, <laughs> this is an absolute first. Um, but on your point about a clear message and will people be able to come in and work, yes they will. What they will not be able to do if they haven't got a job is to claim benefits. Uh, that's the issue. So that's the message on uh, immigration. There's a separate message, of course, on asylum where we've worked very hard to get the numbers down. And that's because a, of the confusion yeah. between people who are coming in as asylum seekers and right. people who are coming in as economic migrants from various countries, tearing up their documents and then pretending to be asylum seekers. Well, I think uh, Baroness Amos made a good point that they won't be able to collect uh, any benefits because I think they're going to be taking the jobs that the people on benefits don't really want. They will get benefits if they're in work, won't they? <laughs> They will get benefits uh, if they're in work after a year. You won't get any benefits for the first year? You won't be able to go to the NHS if you hurt yourself while well, you get your different. first job? Yes, you can go to the NHS, but then your, your country of origin pays for you because of the, because well, of the reciprocal they, they, arrangements that there are between, tax all sorts between of credits, uh, it, European yeah. countries. That's why uh, you can have access Sometimes. to health. Of course you can. I, I, think it's, I think it's time that we in the United Kingdom really walk up to where we want our future to be. This is a magnificent thing that's happening at the European level here. 25 countries coming together, 450 million people coming together in union to work together to work for peace and for sustainable future for Europe. We should be welcoming that. We should be welcoming the opportunity to uh, have people here doing jobs that, yes, to be frank, lots of our people are no longer prepared to do. And we should welcome the opportunities that our companies will have to work in those countries in investing and building those economies. Some of these countries are already richer than Wales, I have to tell you. These are not poor countries, and we could do with some catching up ourselves, and we want to, we want to work with them in that regard. But let's be, let's be clear about this. Something like 7 or 8% of the UK wor workforce are migrants. In, in the United States, something like 15%. In Australia, it's something like 25%. We do need that pool of labour. It does support our economy, and we need to work on the European-wide level in order to make the European Union uh, work. So we do have a lot of debates around the Constitution to have. We do have a lot of debates around the referendum to have. But we need to make a decision. Are we going to be ruled by Bush and Murdoch, or are we going to work with our European partners? Yep. And I know where I want to be. Okay. The woman left. Just, just hear from one or two people, you, madam, and then you, sir, over here. Okay, on the, on the issue of um, EU enlargement, one of the countries that's going in on Saturday is Cyprus, and uh, some of you may know there was actually a um, referendum on Saturday and other Turkish Cypriot, and I was extremely upset by the outcome because what's actually what the outcome has actually meant is that the Greek Cypriots have voted us out of the European Union. We voted yes, the Greek Cypriots voted no for reunification. I mean, if, if it had happened, if they'd voted yes, we would have been the first Muslim community within the EU with official representation. Right. How does the pan panel feel about okay. that? Okay, well, uh, I mean, it's a different question about can, yeah. can I Cypriot intervene? reunification. Do you have to say can I just about a <coughs> health warning on yeah. something that uh, Simon Thomas said? He's greatly in favour of migration and freedom of movement and all the rest of it. But by the way, if you're English, be pretty careful about buying a property and living in some parts of Wales where applied Cymru 
are hounding that's a load the of English nonsense, no, no, and you trying know to keep the of, English out, that's a not load least of by use of that's linguistic absolute, trickery to avoid oh, them getting jobs. I mean, that's a healthy thing to keep the English out. That's, a, that's <laughs> absolute <laughs> nonsense. I mean, are you, are you honestly really telling me that the, the half a million English people living now in Wales aren't enjoying themselves there? I mean, I think they are. In South Wales, they, they, they are because of Plaid Cymru in charge. Are you telling me that if you had if you had a Slovakian coming over as a nurse, you wouldn't want to speak English? He's a okay. separatist for Wales from England, but you. he wants to join England into the European. No, no, I want, okay. I want okay. Wales to join you. Come away, Simon. Right. You made me lose my voice now. You made yep. me so annoyed. Right. Well, that's a good thing, because we'll be able to hear from the man in the second row there. I, um, I mean, I, like everybody else, I, I fully support the enlargement of the EU, and I think people forget that it's a two-way street. And although the majority of the movement may be in our direction yeah. for obvious reasons, um, there's a huge number of people who will enjoy the benefits of being able to access the things that those countries have to offer. Um, I just wonder, though, what the impact on the machinery of the EU will be. Um, it seems to me that the EU is becoming more and more detailed and more and more decisions are having to be made. Um, and at what point does the enlargement of the EU become unwieldy? Um, and will we see an impact on, on the day-to-day -day efficiency of the EU? Well, I mean, the question you talk about, uh, good for 25 people in a union, yeah. is, yeah. I mean, um, the Tory uh, party today talked about a country called Europe and said so they didn't want to belong to a country called Europe. Uh, do you want to belong to a country called Europe? Do you think that's the way to go? Well, I heard um, Michael Howard the other day saying that countries make treaties with each other. Um, it, you know, don't belong to a state. And I think I'd quite like to stay at that level. It's, you know, I support the common market. And, and, and unions have constitutions. And golf clubs, as somebody said the other day. <laughs> Norman two parties, what? including Plaid Cymru's uh, constitution, which is welcome to all English and anyone else who wants to live in the I just, I wouldn't like to see... Hold on a second. Or, no, let's, I don't, I don't no. really want to go into Cyprus for the moment, saving your grace, because I think it's a different issue. Norman Tebbit, do you think the enlargement, and you're very much against the constitution for Europe and all that, do you think the enlargement inevitably will lead towards that pressure? even if Britain resists it. Well, um, what is clear is that we've got to have a new working arrangement within Europe to accommodate the, the new members. The present system was unwieldy anyway, and with another 10 new members and others in sight, it simply will get worse and worse and worse. And there are only two possibilities. You either go towards a country called Europe, in which the capital city is Brussels, and, and that's it. Um, and that's where the Constitution would lead us. Or you say, hold on, chaps, let's sit back a moment and let's see whether there isn't a different construction of Europe in which more of us can do what we want to do and not abstract others from doing what they want to do. If the French and the Germans want to get in bed with each other and, ha and have a, a single state, I don't want to stop them doing that. Why should I? But what I don't want is for them to insist that we have to join it as well. And the Constitution would do that. You can, if you have one Constitution, you're one country. Norman, Simple as that. Norman, I simply do not agree with that. Well, I know um, you don't, but um, and, you're wrong, I'm, you're re I'm really glad. I'm really glad we found, finally found something that we can disagree on. Why, why because you have a constitutional treaty which says how 25 countries work together, and we're talking about how you make a union of 25 work more effectively, that, does that suddenly become one country called well, one Europe? Foreign, if you have a foreign minister, yes, it does. We, we no. actually, in, foreign, in the, in the United foreign, States... Can I just yeah. finish I mean, off on this uh, point? I mean, it's absolutely clear that foreign policy will rest with individual countries, but where, mm -hmm. but where, but where we feel that as a group of 25, we can work more effectively on a particular issue, and peacekeeping is a good example. Um, I was the Minister for Africa, and we made decisions at European level, which meant that we sent in a peacekeeping force into the Democratic Republic of the Congo that was absolutely needed. And we wouldn't have done that, and we wouldn't have been able to do that as the United Kingdom or France uh, without coming together. Let's hear the American point well, of view. I, we have a precedent because in America it originally started out with the Articles of Confederation. And, and the main issue was whether or not states retained their sovereignty. And we ended up the Civil War was what solved the problem. Uh, prior to the 600,000 dead. Exactly. And, and so it's a very, this is a very important point in Europe's history, what they decide to do now, because it could end up, unfortunately, if we, if, if we trust history, which we should, it could end up going down the road being the, the very issue 
that that will lead to uh, to violence and and. Uh, and so your, your instinct would be, on the American experience... That they better that, work that, it out now, that, what exactly that, that having, they mean. No, but that having a, a one constitution is a, is a bad thing. Well, no, no the, constitution, the constitution was called the Great Compromise. And in 1861, the Civil War is what dealt with that compromise, which is where does state authority finally rest. And in the end, it was Abraham Lincoln that determined that it was in okay. the federal constitution and not in the state constitutions. The, the, and the important the woman, thing is that we have the, peace the, the in the European woman, Union. The woman but it's in the green. same issue. Right. Yeah. It's the yeah. same yeah. issue. Well, yeah. I, I may actually, but never mind. Oh, yeah, no, sorry. I'm, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a I minor also aberration. The, yeah. the enlargement of the EU. But what worries me is the difference in our immigration rules. We're allowing people to start working here instantly, whereas most of our partners in Europe are going to wait years and years and years. I thought the EU was about standardization. Valerie Amos, do you want briefly to answer that point? There's freedom of movement across all uh, European countries in the Union. That will apply to every single country. The differences are how different countries are applying their welfare rules. Okay. And we've made decisions on our welfare rules in the same way that other countries have. We must, we must move on. Um, we must move on because time is running out on us. Nick Thompson, please. Nick Thompson. Are identity cards a genuine weapon in combating terrorism? or simply a smokescreen for the government to bring the population under tighter central control. Mm. Hamza Yusuf, do you favour compulsory ID cards? Well, well you I have in the States. I would say we, we actually don't technically, but if, if you don't have one, you better watch out if you're walking around. <laughs> so, I mean, I would say that, again, we're dealing with one of these very, very difficult slippery mm. slopes because what's happening with terrorism it's being used by certain elements within the united states to basically diminish the civil liberties of of the citizenry and there's a lot of americans that are deeply concerned in fact i know for a fact that it, republicans are are actually going to vote democratic this year i mean there's there's republicans that are very deeply concerned with the patriot act and these things so i think that you know one of the things i love about coming to to, to Great Britain is, is I tend to breathe a sigh of relief as I smell the fragrance of, of liberty. And uh, I'm really worried about uh, losing that pleasant uh, atmosphere that you have in this country. I mean, last year I didn't have to show my ID to fly to Scotland. This year I did. And I, I think that that's a real tragedy. Although, on the other hand, you've got a really serious problem with people uh, that are you know troublemakers but ultimately yeah. they can they can always forge these ideas yeah, and I mean it's I think it is that that troublemaker point is exactly right I think that I, I don't know I mean personally it's one of these things you have to look at well personally it wouldn't bother me if I had to carry an identity card I carry a driver's license I need a passport I need to give the names of my great-grandmothers if I want to pay my bill and um, you know whatever it, it wouldn't really bother me to carry another piece of plastic with my face on it and, and my details however Symbolically, it certainly is a further move to have state power over civilian um, power. And I think that that is rather patronizing. Um, on the other hand, I hate to sit on the fence on this, but on the other hand, um, you know, we are living in paranoid, dangerous times, and it perhaps is a way to, to um, uh, you know, to sharpen up security. But, yeah, but, you know, it is state power over civilian, and that's kind of rich, isn't it, when they kind of mess with our lives every day anyway. State I'm, and I'm not sure where you stand on this issue, Exactly, because right I, stand, I stand on the fence and it's really annoying. I thought about this and I thought we might be talking about this. I wouldn't mind carrying it in my wallet, David, but, you know, symbolically, symbolically, it's kind of wrong. Okay, the man in the purple shirt. Yes, uh, as I understand it, I think the proposal is that these be made compulsory in 2013. Now, perhaps I'm pessimistic, but I think we might be subject to attack somewhat before then. Yeah, we'll, all, we'll all be dead then by the imminent nuclear strike that's going to happen probably by the end of this decade due to the demise of, uh, of the globe. You can laugh, but that's what's ahead of us. The, the woman in the back there. <laughs> Sorry. Um, can you get to the person at the very back? Um, would um, Sheikh Hamza please explain a bit more about the Patriot Act? Because I don't believe it has got enough publicity in this country right. and I believe it should be something well, that should be questioned and yeah. the civil liberties I personally wouldn't mind carrying an ID card but I would like to know more right. about the that I wouldn't like the fight on terrorism to um, be 
blown out of proportion. Well, we can't have a seminar on the Patriot Act, but maybe well, you can just briefly Well, I won't do explain. that, but briefly, I mean, people now, the writ of habeas corpus, which is, I think, something we're all very proud of in the, in the West, is, is, is lost. I mean, you have uh, American citizens that have been basically arrested and have no recourse to legal representation. And, and I think that, you know, these things are a sign of the times, but I think there's something, a lot of people died in, in, in these lands to ensure that we would, we would be free people. And I think that to forget that, to forget the numbers of people that died, that we yeah. might be free people and not be controlled by government. And all of them were very wary of government. And I think that we should also maintain that vigilance. Simon mm. Thomas. I think we're at um, a real crossroads here. We, we are used to a free, liberal, tolerant society. We are under threat. Uh, partly by terrorism, partly due to the actions that we've taken ourselves. But, you know, that, that's the situation we find ourselves in now. So we need to think about how we actually deal with this. Now, I'm convinced that identity cards do not deal with terrorism. All those who carried out some recent atrocities had identity cards. Spain. It's intelligence in, in Spain, in 9-11 yeah. in, in, in and so forth. It's intelligence that deals with terrorism. Three billion pounds minimum is going to be spent on this scheme. That's money I'd like to see spent on solving some of the problems that give rise to terrorism in the first place and solving some of the intelligence difficulties we have in acknowledging and knowing where that terrorist threat is coming from. And the second thing... I think the, the second thing I have to say, David, just, just quickly, is that we, I think we can all feel fairly relaxed, perhaps, like Rona, about the idea that our uh, passport come, driver's license come, everything else is, is there. The question is not the identity card itself. It's the database that the government keeps on us as individuals mm. about all our information. That has not been answered. And I would say this, until we have a written constitution in this country that guarantees what our freedom is and our relationship with the state, then we should not give the state the power to have identity cards over our lives. Okay. The man in the blue uh, with the green stripe on you, sir. Uh, you were discussing um, identity cards in relation to terrorism, mm. but we were just discussing about our fears of immigration. Surely identity cards would solve the problem of illegal immigrants to this country? Norman Tebbit? In what way? Um, I, think, I think uh, anybody who is clearly and decisively of one view or the other on identity cards hasn't thought very much about it. I think it's very difficult not to be somewhat on the fence on this issue. First of all, let me say that I believe that my right to walk down the street is not dependent upon the state giving me that right or giving me a piece of paper which says I have that right. And I'm very reluctant indeed to let the state, by giving me a piece of paper, say they're giving me that right. It's mine. It always has been. And, and that is why we and the Americans come to the same conclusion, which is very different, I might say, to that which is held by most people on the continent of Europe. But on the other hand, I acknowledge that we're living in extremely difficult times. Uh, I don't like the expression war on terrorism because it's not a war in that sense. But during those times, we do have to concede some of our liberties in order to save our liberties. So I come down in the end saying, yes, I might agree. That sounded I like might George agree. Orwell. <laughs> well, we did, we did during the Second World War. Yeah. So we had to intern thing, people without trial during thing. the Second World War. Oh. And we had to do all sorts of difficult things of that kind. I mean, but at the end of the day, war, if I may yeah. just finish mm -hmm. with this sentence, what makes me most uneasy about identity cards is not that they would be abused by this government. I don't believe they would be. But I am not sure that they wouldn't be abused at some time further down the road by another government and particularly by that government in Brussels which is essentially corporatist, authoritarian, centralist and somewhat fascist. Well, I think the first thing to say is that I don't think that identity cards in any way would solve um, all the problems that people think will be solved by us having ID cards. And I certainly think just a narrow relationship between ID cards and terrorism, yes. uh, that somehow ID cards is going to solve a problem of terrorism, I don't think that that washes at all. I think the That's issue... what you said initially. Not at all. It's it, not, it, was. it wasn't. What David Blunkett said initially uh, was it was a part of the fight against terrorism. 
part of the fight against <laughs> terrorism. <laughs> Uh, part, part of the fight you know, against it, terrorism would be but there are, whole, Iraq. there are a whole number of other things that Not need to be looked at. Not being a stupid illegal war in the and first place. And also the fact that, uh, you know, biometrics are being introduced all over the world and we're going to have to have biometric uh, data on our passports. We're eventually going to have it on our driving licenses. So to pretend that we're not going to go down that road, I think, would be nonsensical. The other thing I want to say is that there is a real issue about how they're used. And there is an issue about whether or not we move to compulsion. Now, the decision on that will not be taken for another 10 years. And when it is taken, it will be taken by Parliament. It will be put to Parliament. There will have to be a vote. And it would have to be agreed in the context that uh, existed at that time. OK, Nick Thompson asked a question. What do you think? I personally am very worried. I I'm, I'm agree totally with uh, uh, Lord Tebbett. I, I think that my one worry is the future government. But I also worry that the present government, which didn't really, uh, hasn't really given us the real reason for going to war in Iraq, or with the Hutton inquiry has shown us that they um, can perhaps play with information, not tell us the entire yep. truth, might actually use the information to, uh, to perhaps maybe not sinister but yeah uh, oh, we'll all be rounded up everybody like me who was arrested for my involvement with the anti-nuclear movement in the early 80s will all be rounded up when things get out of control you think it'll be on your record why is my yes, why, why is my hiv absolutely. status relevant why because is my hiv status relevant that's apparently what what's going to be put on why are they going to be in shops identity card readers i don't think is H your hiv status wait, apparently on the no. well according to your bbc news reports uh, um. <laughs> don't, don't trust the, the decisions about the data have not been taken yet. But, but I mean, isn't, what we're going isn't this the danger? We've is taken a decision on principle so without knowing about the data. All right, let's yeah. hear from three people. Yeah. Yeah. There's three yeah. people up there. Them. I'm not saying there are three people all with their hands up. Let's just go along. One, two, three. Briefly, if you would. Such a big the woman, uh, the woman, first of all, on the right. I hardly think that an ID card is going to prevent terrorism. But oh. I do think that this country has been a soft touch for illegal immigrants for far too long. And I welcome any move that's going to prevent this for the future. OK, and the man next to you. Um, I think it's phenomenal what's being justified in the, name, in, in the name of the war on terror. We already have a number of people detained in Belmarsh without charge, and amazingly, without even being questioned for months on end, I think the ID card will just be used as a tool to deny, deny basic human rights, and I really fear that we're going to end up living um, in a police state. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, if the public's got nothing to hide, then why should they be so afraid of simply carrying something with their identity on? Thank you. I think the three of you ought to have an argument yeah, together. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, the, the gentleman in blue here, just down here on the corner. I just think it's an excellent idea because then in Wales, when the English come over, we can see that they're English by their identity cards. We can come up from the coal mines wearing daffodils and leeks and leave the sheep alone, play rugby and all the other cliches you want to bring up, Lord Tebbit. And what you said was absolutely disgraceful. It's not far off what the BMP get away with saying. Oh, um, poor <laughs> OK. Last brief word. Yeah. On the ID cards, mm. uh, I feel like it's been really interesting uh, discussing this, and I feel uh, I, I'm much more... Are you more off the fence now? I, I am off the fence. I'm, <laughs> against, I'm against ID cards. Excellent. I've just suddenly remembered my, my, my history in the early 80s of being arrested for anti-nuclear um, activities, and I think that there will be a you know, uh, police state, and uh, it's just heading okay. to that. All right. Why well, we, we, we never know. We, we, not never know. Well, we, I mean, this is desperate times. This is scaremongering at its worst. Right. Well, it's, Why is it Codswell? We have ten years to find out. You're not, you're not going to buy all this rubbish about it. I mean, okay. it, it can it, we very have to quickly. Stop. We've it's run a out small screen. Not, not even very good. <laughs> <laughs> Apologies to those of you who didn't get in. Our time's up. You can carry on the debate on the website. It was her fault. My thanks to the panel here, to all of you who came here to London to take part in the programme. We're going to be in Birmingham next week. Uh, the Labour Minister Yvette Cooper, Nicholas Soames, the Shadow Defence Secretary, Lord Steele, the former leader of the Liberal Democrats, Bishop John Sentiment.